morning, everyone. Um, let's just pray, pray again. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Help us to hear your word this morning, Lord, and to feed upon it. Amen. The place is Rouen. The year is 1893. Claude Monet applies the last brushstroke to his painting of the front of Rouen Cathedral and steps back to cast an eye over his latest work. Later, he will take the painting back to his workshop and add it to the collection of paintings he has produced. Of that same facade, of that same cathedral, all 31 of them. The paintings in the series each capture the front of the cathedral at different times of the day and year and reflect changes in its appearance under different lighting conditions. Similarly, Jesus draws his followers' attention to the seven very different statements about his purpose and character. In the I am statements in John's Gospel, there are seven of them. I am the bread of life, John 6. I am the light of the world, John 8. I am the gate, John 10. I am the good shepherd, also John 10. I am the resurrection and the life, John 11. I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14. And lastly, I am the true vine, John 15. Over the next seven weeks, we will be exploring each of them and building a picture of Jesus. At the end, our aim is to be in a much better position to answer the question, who is Jesus? For ourselves and for those who may be asking us this question. Today I'm looking at the first of these I am sayings. I am the bread of life. But before doing that, let me say a word or two of background to the I am sayings. You'll remember the incident incident in Exodus 3 when Moses encounters God by the burning bush. God announces to the rather reluctant Moses that it's he, Moses, whom God has chosen to deliver to his fellow Israelites, to deliver his fellow Israelites from slavery under the Egyptians. Moses asks, what name should he give if asked by the Israelites who has sent him? God replies in Exodus 3, which we've just had read to us, in verse 14, I am who I am. Tell them, I am has sent you. I am, then, refers to God himself. It's the name by which God chooses to be called. When Jesus applies the title, I am, to himself, He's claiming to be God. I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am, Jesus says in John 8, 58. He's not claiming to be God's assistant, a wise man, or a great teacher. He's claiming to be God, without beginning and end, eternal, unchanging, the very source of life. And Jesus knows exactly what he's doing by taking the name of the eternal God to himself. His Jewish opponents know this too. They recognize the enormous significance of this claim. The blasphemy as they see it. That's why they immediately pick up stones to kill him in the verse which follows. John 8, 59. Now let's turn our attention to our passage from John, passages 
from chapter 6 of John's Gospel. It's here in verse 35 that Jesus makes that great declaration, I am the bread of life. But first, to understand this claim, we need to remind ourselves of two earlier miracles. One which occurred hundreds of years before. That is the miracle described in Exodus 16, when God rained down bread from heaven, or manna, to satisfy the physical hunger of the Israelites in the desert. The other is the great miracle which occurs when Jesus feeds 5,000 famished followers. We've just had it read to us in John John chapter 6. And we need to spend a little time on this miracle because it's at the heart of the I am statement we're looking at this morning. And by the way, it's only one It's only one of two miracles which appear in all four Gospels, the other being the resurrection. The scale of this miracle is amazing. We've heard it read to us a few minutes ago, but let's just briefly resume some of the verses. In verse 2, a great crowd of people were following him, that is Jesus, Verse 5, he saw a great crowd of people coming towards him. Verse 7, Philip said to Jesus, it would take more than eight months' wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. In verse 9, the disciples question how five small loaves and two small fish could ever feed so many. And verse 10, we learn that about 5,000 men sat down to eat. It's understandable that the disciples doubted whether the crowd could all be fed. But Jesus knew what to do. He gave thanks, and the disciples distributed as much food as the people needed. Just as in Exodus, when the great I am provided, Jesus here provides for his people. Bread was the all-important element of the local diet, the basic diet of the common people in a first-century eastern land. Together with wine, due to the impurity of the water, it formed the basis of life. With bread you lived, without bread you died. The crowds in this passage would have been living from hand to mouth. So having someone like Jesus around who could provide the food they needed was literally a God send. But whilst we can feel some sympathy for them, we need to realize that they were missing the central point of Jesus' miracle. They are far. Sorry. Verse 14 does show that the crowd recognized Jesus to be a great prophet. They say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. But they are far from truly understanding him. Verse 30 says, so they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you and show them? where their real need lay. In verse 27 to 28, he said, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And in verse 33 he says, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. 
and in verse 34 to make his point utterly clear, Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. Six and 27, that there are two kinds of food. Food for the body, which is necessary, but not the most important. And food for the inner person, the spirit, which is essential. Neither manna on the journey to the promised land in Moses' time, nor loaves in the promised land in Jesus' time could satisfy the core hunger which Jesus came to satisfy. Jesus' bold declaration, I am the bread of life, connects the miracle of the loaves and fish and the fish to the significance of his life's purpose. Jesus is the bread of life as he nourishes people spiritually of their soul. In this sense, those who trust in him shall not hunger. Their spiritual longing to know God will be satisfied. What then from this passage, what impact can it have on the way we lead our lives? I'd like to suggest three things. I don't know whether you can see that in red there on the blue, but anyway, I'll spell it out. Uh, one, beware of distractions. Two, believe in him. Three, go tell. So firstly, beware of distractions. Fo food and eating is clearly a vital part of our lives. It's a bit rich, perhaps, to downplay its importance. After all, didn't Jesus himself urge us to pray, give us today our daily bread? In the special prayer he himself taught us. And here, I think, he was referring to the physical bread or sustenance we need each day to sustain our minds and bodies. But however satisfying food is, it only satisfies us temporarily. How many of us consume a large evening meal only to be more than ready for breakfast the following morning? Or a large Christmas lunch only to be hankering after turkey sandwiches later in the day? And it could be said it's the same with other activities and pleasures which satisfy, satisfy us for a while, but only for a while. Hobbies, sport, going to the gym, watching TV, dining out with friends, surfing the internet. They're all okay, in moderation. But they can only ever be a source of temporary satisfaction. They don't feed the inner man or woman Some of us could add career to this list of examples. For example, you secure a long sought after promotion only to find that it doesn't satisfy you in the way you expected. And it's not long before you find yourself looking for the next step up the ladder. There's nothing wrong in being ambitious per se, but we should clear so we should be clear about its limitations. These and other things all promise satisfaction for a short time, but they are, in Jesus' words, food that spoils. And we need to be aware of their temporary or ephemeral nature. I'm not suggesting that we all become monks or nuns, that we do not li live life to the full, but we must be aware of our need for a deeper, long-term, even eternal satisfaction. Which leads 
to point number two, believe in him. We need to focus our attention on the bread which lasts, the bread which satisfies our spiritual hunger, the bread which Jesus provides. The big challenge of our hearts is to keep feasting on Jesus, to keep coming to him and being renewed by his provision, physically and spiritually. To do this, we need to spend more time with him. the scriptures, more time in prayer, more time with other Christians, a longer quiet time, joining a home group, and so on. It's obvious really, but in practice, very challenging of the age. It is very challenging to tell others about Jesus, but we're not alone. Jesus is with us always. We're not all called to be great evangelists, thankfully. Leave that to those who have the right personality and skills. Can work out our own way. Our way may be modest, discreet, gentle, leading by example. But we are called upon to tell others who have yet to hear or understand the word. For the prize is beyond measure. To enable others to join us at the heavenly banquet where we feed on Jesus, the bread of life, the bread which never grows stale, 